Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I am Yonja Karakoc, Director of Arts Transcending Borders at the College of the Holy Cross in Western Massachusetts. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's ATD Homestage Livestream featuring artist Kevork Morat. We started the semester with a virtual visit to Kevork's Burpin Studio, and after a very full schedule, we're visiting with an amazing lineup, a lineup of recent guest artists at the college. We will be ending our fall series today with a conversation with Kevork, building towards his spring 2021 residency with us. As I think about some of the themes I expect will come up in today's conversation with Kevork, including the artist's role in conjuring and recreating memory of place and layers of history and culture embedded in it, I'm reminded of the history of this land where our college was built 170 odd years ago. Holy Cross is situated on Mount St. James, originally known as Packetrock Hill, part of the traditional lands of the Nipmuc people. Let us take a moment to honor and acknowledge their elders past, present, and future. I'd also like to do a quick shout out to a documentary film that just screened this last weekend, Packetrog, Where the River Bends. It was created by several of our colleagues and presented by the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture at the college. It is a must see for all of us who live, study, and work here. Our campus and local audiences are no strangers to Kevork's art. In 2017, ATD presented Home Within, a breathtaking collaboration where he shared the stage with fellow Silk Road artist and fellow Syrian clarinetist Kinan Azme. Since then, a range of residencies, both as part of the Silk Road Ensemble and individually, have brought Kevork back to our campus. We're truly enamored by his astonishing range of practice, his artistic curiosity, as well as his generosity of spirit in working with students and young people, and are now very excited to invite him to create an installation at the college's Cantor Art Gallery in the spring. In a little bit, you'll get a glimpse into how that project is beginning to take form. So yes, thanks very much uh, for tuning in today. As I mentioned, this is our final live stream for the fall semester, and we'll be back with more in the spring. This event is being recorded and will be available at the same link for the next seven days, so feel free to share with those whom you think may be interested. This is live, so I also invite you to be part of the conversation with your reactions and comments and questions. You can use the chat, chat function on the right side of your screen to join in. With a special thanks, I'll now invite Mark Freeman, Distinguished Professor of Ethics and Society and Professor of Psychology at the college, and member of Arts Transcending Borders Steering Committee as the host of today's conversation. Enjoy. Thank you, Yanja. Welcome, everyone. A special welcome to my friend Kevork Morad, who I've had the pleasure of getting to know over the past few years, and also my fellow panelists and friends, Oswaldo Golihoff composer and Loyola professor of music here at Holy Cross, and Meredith Fluke, director of the Iris and B. Gerald Cantor Art Gallery, also here at Holy Cross. It's great to be with you all, even if from afar. And great to have the opportunity both to see some of Kevork's extraordinary work and to be in dialogue about the many issues his work raises. When I first encountered Kevork's work through the piece Home Within that Yanja just mentioned, which we'll show a clip of shortly, I was taken aback by the seeming ease and the fluidity with which images started growing before my eyes. It was as if the images had been there all along and were somehow revealing themselves in a kind of organic profusion, like plants or flowers shooting up from the soil. Where was it all coming from? I wondered. And then there was Kevork's partner in the piece, Kenan Azma, whose clarinet helped to tell the story, or if not tell it, gesture toward it, artfully. Image and music, working together, breathing together. 
really mesmerizing. Those are fond memories and very significant ones. With that, let's take a look at a segment from Home Within and see for ourselves. Wonderful. I, I still found it memorizing, mesmerizing. <laughs> well, some years have passed uh, since that time. Um, and a lot of new work has emerged. We'll be seeing some of it shortly. For now, Kavork, let's talk a bit about the title of this event. As you may recall, um, perhaps painfully, I wrote to you one morning a while back having made my way through some of your work and also speaking with you and Yanja and Meredith. And I floated maybe 15 titles for this event, um, ranging from a memory myth and the possibility of humanity all the way to the memory of architecture slash the architecture of memory. I kind of like those. But the one you connected to was the one that brings us together here today. 
the migration of memory. I wrote to you at 6.36 in the morning and you responded by eight o'clock that same morning. And you said, that's the one I want, quote, it somehow reflects directly on my approach in my art journey. So can you share some thoughts with us about that, focusing on the idea of migration and the idea of memory and how they've worked together for you in this amazing journey you've been on? Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for making me part of this amazing panel. And thanks for the Holy Cross for creating this opportunity to share these moments with people around the world, and especially uh, in this hardship to support, support artists and art. I think it's important more than ever. Uh, the title, for sure, spoke to me. It felt like a direct translation of my work. When I think about uh, migration or I think about memory, right away my ancestors come in front of me and I think about them when they came to Syria as refugees. Hundred some years ago, my ancestors were the first refugees in Syria and Syrian people opened their arm, different culture, different language. We started creating our um, culture there almost almost from scratch and we became part of the fabric serum fabric and people are following if they're following the news the, the news of the last 10 years and even the news of what's what's happened uh, in, in armenia recently people are forced to leave their homes they're forced to move somewhere else and the only thing you take with you the memories and sometimes little photographs or an old book and you cherish to kind of create more out of that memory. And I feel like my works, every time I put a line, it's without even thinking, all these memories kind of project into work and reflects back all kind of echoes of my ancestors. Yeah. Okay. Let's continue with that a little bit. Um, one of the things that I've always appreciated about your work, both visually and at the level of ideas, is the multi-dimensional way in which you address the idea and the practice of memory, personal, cultural, even archetypal, right? Having to do with the kind of deep, archaic memory that Carl Jung and others have talked about. Um, this last idea is for some of my students out there who are now reading Jung. So personal, cultural, even archetypal. Can you say something about these different dimensions of memory um, and why for you they're all intrinsic to your work? I'm going to bring a very short example, something from my childhood. Uh, growing up in Aleppo, you are witnessing a very dense uh, history and multi-civilizations kind of built on top of each other. And I was so fortunate to witness that when I was walking with my friends in Sunday morning to go to the Armenian church. This is the old part of Aleppo. And one a specific uh, image uh, really carved a memory uh, in me and into my works. So when you enter the church on the right side, there's this little marble and people, when they walked in, they touched the marble and they kissed the marble and they crossed. That marble is melted from kissing. So basically that marble made the shape of people's face. So, and that's like a small example and plus the iconography there and the streets. And when you look at uh, the outside of that church, you'll see a mosque and you see, you know, uh, reminiscent of the synagogue and, and other churches, different faiths build on top of each other. So when you're living in that part of the world, you think all the world outside of that city or the country is the same. But when I came uh, to America, I realized, no, that was almost like past. We lived in past, even though we're living 
now, but it was like for people in the West, that's at least like 500 years ago. So those things, for me, it's important to put it into works where people in the West can kind of witness the, how other cultures exist together, coexist, and also the role of art. I feel like art should document that, should take that approach where future generations looking through the art, experiencing the past. Otherwise, who's going to collect this, these memories and put them into works? And when I create that, I feel like I'm vessel, I'm like, a channel, channeling all these informations and it's coming to the works. When I see my work after I finish it, I feel like I have not even touched this work. Mm. It can't, comes out just by itself. And that's an interesting feeling. I feel like memory plays a huge role because I work very fast. Sometimes I have even the approach of improvising what I'm creating. I have the overall idea what I'm creating, but what line goes in and what stroke I'm putting there it's, it needs to be fluid and it needs to be kind of spontaneous gestures to reflect wow. on the idea of memory and calligraphy and voice and music and uh, facade of the building. And it's, there's so much, so much out there. I'm telling you, dense, dense history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, you've said so much there. I mean, on, on one level, the way you talk about memory, it sounds almost geologic, right? as if there are different layers or strata and that if we could somehow see all of those different layers maybe even at once we would have some sense of the depth of history that exists in a particular place um, and and the other thing that you said is that for you memory is also in it's it's fused with imagination right i mean it's not your memory per se. And a lot of it has to do also with what you imagine the world was. Is that a fair thing to ask? Or is that, is that right? I think to think about the memory, memory belongs, belongs to, uh, to all of us in a way that if you are witnessing an artifact or in, in a, you're in a historic place, definitely triggers triggers certain feelings and right. you sometimes see that the person next to you or your friends can can feel witness the same thing it means there is a collective feeling and collective um, memory idea when you're when you're witnessing something powerful so to to put right. all that into the work and to create layers of work the way you said a strata of memory which i think a little bit later will show uh, my, one of my early early layered piece it, it's important because First, there's a time element. What happened there in that part of the world? Who was there before? You know, and then you're going to witness, like through the imagination, what's going to happen after that. So sometimes, uh, thinking mm. about the past, it's good way to think about the future. So it's like create this idea of like layer. Let's say three thousand years ago, something. You know, it could be the, the uh, Citadel of Aleppo or, or Palmyra and all that. Everyone knows those symbols. And then you build something on the top, which is imaginary, but at the same time, the inspiration is from the city of Aleppo, let's say. And then on the top, something right. about future. So when oh, yeah. I lay all this thing together, it becomes artistic take on creating historic, but imaginary history that you kind of, as an artist, uh, you think about what will happen if it goes in this direction and it becomes people's responsibility not to let it go in worse direction or right. a brighter direction. So it becomes like it's up to the, 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 the person who is witnessing all this to choose to help not to collapse all the civilizations. Sure, sure. We're almost out of time, you and I, unfortunately, but I, ha I have to ask you one more question. Right? One other memory, uh, migration of memory question. Um, I'm thinking especially of your piece, The Memories of Stone, which uh, we'll be seeing a little bit later. From one angle, the title connotes people's memories of stone. From another though, it's about the stone's memories, right? It's about the way in which memories can become inscribed in things, in this case, stone. 
So if the first way of thinking about memory brings us to what's in our heads, the second one brings us to what's in the world, right? So where is memory for you? So one interesting moment, I was exploring the idea of uh, sound. Uh, it's a fascinating thing when you think about the past and you think in the, that same physical space, who were there and who left sound and voices there. So I started exploring this, this philosophy where maybe sometimes it's okay to think about the sound actually creates grooves or carves, creates dents in the stone. If you, you philosophically go back in time and imagine who was, who was next to that stone and speaking what, and later on, if the stone can capture that sound and today can, can tell us what happened, let's say, a thousand years ago, it's an incredible concept. So I decided to, to explore the idea of uh, what happened in Spain a thousand years ago when different faiths coexisted. They were part of the same government. And, and harmoniously, they built incredible amount of artifacts and, and, and uh, a dense civilization there. And the stones, for me, they were telling us, now it's a thousand years later. What have you achieved? Where are you? Until now, they have not figured out a way to coexist continuously in fights, continuously destroying each other. Mm -hmm. So it, in, in one symbolic way, this artwork, it's kind of creates this mirror. We're looking at this artwork, seeing ourselves and feeling a bit, a bit shamed. We need to be in a much, much better place a thousand years later. Right. This is how it was. And also this is how it could be. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. We're going to, uh, continue moving along now. And at this point, um, Kevork will be in dialogue with Osvaldo Goliath talking about issues of creative process and musicality and some other things besides. And so I turn it over now to us. Hi, hi, Kevork. Um, great seeing you. Um, great. So, um, I was uh, thinking, you know, Mark hinted at the beginning of his uh, talk, uh, he, he described what does it mean to see you, quote unquote, perform, right? And then, and then you and him went into the themes that are your themes, right? Uh, the what? what? What are you painting about? And I, I thought maybe we should for our segment between Mark and Meredith to focus on the how, right? Which is, um, how do you do it, <laughs> right? Uh, and, it, and it's back to that uh, sense that Mark and me and everyone that has seen you paint has, like we are like children at the magic show, like how is this possible? How is this happening? And when you do it to music, right? I mean, like, like a jazz, um, improviser or like a dancer that is spontaneously uh, dialoguing with the music is, is truly, I, I mean, I don't know if you yourself can explain any of that, but this is, I think, something that doesn't matter if people know what you are talking about, so to speak. People are like, what? I didn't ask you any question, maybe, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, can you, but you, you hinted a little bit, like, how, how, what is your frame of mind before, let's say, a performance of a piece that you don't know, that, that you just, like, let's say the musicians are, what is, it, what, what is in your head? So, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Oswaldo, for being part of this. I admire you, and I love your work for 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 many 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 years so now that we became friends and we're collaborating mm -hmm. that's like an honor and, and dream come true thank you so first of all when i create a line i want to uh emphasize that this this concept of there the lines kind of reflect on uh, the idea of in that part of the world in the middle east there were this tradition of storytelling and mm -hmm. the calligrapher and the form of art where people kind of 
passed uh, through generations, um, uh, stories and songs and all that. So when I put the line, I think about all of that. So almost like the calligrapher is just writing this one perfect line. And that line can reflect on the emotions and the journey and the sound. Everything was there. Everything, everything. So that is for me the very first thing. The line should reflect on this movement and the fluidity and history, everything. So now to think about that approach on top of it, when I have a moving piece of music where that music it's already speaks to me and speak to many people, I feel like the music can hold my hand and create that by itself. So that is one. Mm. And on top of that, I developed and I started creating, like I've been doing this for the last 20 years, this performance, but throughout the time, I always want to invent and create new things. I added the, the element of animation. So animation and live drawing, they're very different approach. Animation, sometimes if you're going to see something, let's say 10 seconds, that could take one or two weeks to create. Right. But the live drawing, in one minute, I could create this entire thing very fast. But I use this concept of paint. When I touch the paint to the surface, I don't go back to erase it. It's linear. It's like sound. It goes. It moves always forwards. So together with 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 music, it creates kind of a juxtapoint of storytelling. Fantastic. You know, uh, since I don't know how many students, uh, 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 how many Holy Cross students we are having today, but I I thought before. We, I would like to show what you the, the extraordinary thing that you did uh, to in our collaboration. But before, I would like to to talk for just a minute at least um, about something that is going on at Holy Cross, which is how can we what what is creativity? What how do we just shift our frame of mind from? excelling at something you know or which or complying with something to to creating what are the attributes of creativity and i, I you know obviously in your uh, in your case is an extraordinary amount of risk taking because as you said there is you you don't erase you just like go with time with music you go forward and and it takes like a huge trust in yourself and also trust in what Miles Davis said, uh, there are no mistakes. And I would like for you to tell that story of the ink blot when your, your, when your little, when your ink uh, uh, jar exploded. What, t tell us a little bit about that. So uh, many years ago, probably one of the earlier performances was, took place at Juilliard. I think through that I met Yo-Yo Ma and uh, through Yo-Yo Ma I met you too. So it's an interesting journey. So I was at Juilliard uh, with uh, Kinan and Dinuk and uh, a couple more musicians. And I was doing the drawing, but sometimes at early, early uh, stages of my performance, I was so anxious and a bit nervous. So when you're nervous, so my tool is this. I invented this tool many years ago. It's a paint inside of this and has a very, very thin nib here. And if this is clean, it flows out very perfectly. But because this is something that I made, it's not perfect for this, sometimes clubs. So especially when you're, you're nervous, you're pushing, extra pushing. When you're pushing it, the pressure is there. So I'm drawing, and it's almost like in the middle of the performance, and I'm pressing, pressing it. It's not going, and I press it harder, and then the paint exploded on this paper. So it's imagine on this big screen, you see this big, just crazy, random paint. And there, I decided to just kind of uh, uh, control and just be zen about it. I just, I said, this is disaster. This is the end of everything. And by the way, in my mind, that was the end of performance. I was not going to perform after that. So I took the paint and I just mm -hmm. moved it in a shape and right and created the most out of what was there. Mm -hmm. So I finished and I was a bit embarrassed. And later on, someone approached. She said. Um, I am very moved by this performance, but I have to tell you one thing. If I did not see that paint explosion on the paper, I would have thought that this whole thing is filmed. I thought you're playing film for us. Now, I want to purchase all of the drawings. There was like about 10, 12 drawings. I want to purchase all this, and I want to be in touch, and I want to see everything you do from now on. So it's interesting how the kind of this 
crazy accident from my point of view that moment was the end of i think it kind of opened up this this brighter future yeah it is it, I, i think we come back to the concept of trust right i mean your story is is the it's like the paint story that is parallel to one of the most famous and extraordinary jazz stories that every every musician knows which is a story that Herbie Hancock the wonderful pianist tells about him being very young like you were and playing with Miles Davis and the band the quintet and is the music is rocking and suddenly he does the ink plot suddenly he plays the completely wrong chord and he wants to die and the next second Miles Davis from that chord make it makes it sound right and that is what i wish our students could uh, uh, internalize that that idea of trust, trust in yourself, trust in your collaborator, and go with the time, just connect with the time. Before we finish, uh, and here we finish, I guess, but let's play a, a, one of the little trailers of our collaboration so, so people can have a, a, a glimpse to your work as an animator. And it's great to see you. <laughs> זה כמו מלמול, 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 רישוש בתוך הראש. זה כמו מלמול, כמו רישוש בתוך הראש. זה כמו מלמול, 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 מלמול. אלים את אימי כבר נהרים. אלים את אימי כבר נהרים. ומי שואל את אלים. If I don't tell it like a story, I will never understand what happened to me, what happened to him, because he'll never, never, never. There's a buzz inside my head. Hi, Kevork. I'm popping in. Do you want to say anything about that piece that we just saw, just to... To finish up, Actually, so we, we know what we're looking at. I would love that. So I, I want to uh, express uh, this thought that I have about Oswaldo and, and, and our collaboration. Uh, he talked about trust. So I would love to mention that when Oswaldo asked me to create this animation, he did not give me any guidance. He said, you know, I know your work. I trust you, as he said. I love... Uh, your way of thinking, and I want that, that to be seen in the works. And I took that, and I worked on my own, and I decided to create this imagery in. And of course, this is going to be a, a longer a project. This is just a small part of it. And I created this symbolic, let's say, the boy's face and the mother and the, 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 the writer in a way that I imagined it to be. And he right away loved it, and it was kind of the beginning of our this long uh, collaboration. It is kind of trust is important thing to to mention here. Yeah, and it's great to see a bit of of what you've been working on. Um, everyone should know that this is a a, a very long project um, that Osvaldo and cave work will will continue uh, working on for a while. It's great to see a piece of it. I'm excited to see more. Um, and as others have mentioned, we're really excited to uh, bring you to campus in the spring. Um, looking forward to having you at the Cantor Gallery. Um, I think it's going to be a new experience um, for the audiences that we have at Holy Cross who have gotten to know you so well um, through the performances you've done on campus, uh, your work with the Silk Road group and the animation work um, that we've seen. I suspect a good deal of our audience uh, hasn't had the opportunity to experience one of your installation pieces. and. Am I still talking to Cave Work? See here. I can keep talking about what I like about Cave Work for a second. <laughs> so, um, so Cave Work, I, I I first had the opportunity to see his work um, at the Rose Art Museum in 2017. Hi, Cave Work. I was just talking about you. Surprise. Um, so I was just saying that I had the, the good fortune to see Immortal City 
at the Rose Art Museum back in 2017, um, which is of course one of the reasons I asked you, Cave Work, uh, to uh, join me and work on a project at the Cantor Art Gallery. Uh, the piece at the Rose Art Museum, and hopefully we can see a clip of it. Um, there it is. Uh, it featured really intricate drawings, and you've seen some of Cave Work's drawings. Um, they were made more intricate by uh, cutting into the paper and, and making windows, and then suspending the layers um, one in front of the other. And we had all of this access to um, different pieces as we moved around the work. Um, and I know that that uh, you sort of took that idea with Memories of Stone um, that you that you installed at the Aga Khan last year in Toronto, um, but increased the scale. So if we could see a piece of that as well, Memories of Stone. There it is. Um, and of course, these layers that you can, um, you know, experience from the front, but then your views change as you move around the piece. So what I would love to hear from you um, in the beginning here, what I want to talk about is your approach to these large scale installations um, compared to the performance or the animation pieces that we that we're so familiar with. Um, the performance pieces require this profound spontaneity that you've been talking about and the fluidity um, both are I think are integral to your work um, which you've you know obviously talked about so how do you determine the balance of this idea of improvisation and spontaneity um, and then planning when you're creating a piece that that stands alone yeah it's a great question so I want to start with uh, start off memory uh, I was so fortunate to um, have to be asked to create the work for the Rose Art Museum. Uh, that was two, two and a half years ago. Um, my first time exploring layered work, and it was uh, important for me to capture uh, Syria for me, to capture what, what's, what's there, what is, what, is, you know, what is like for an artist to grow up in Syria and to put all that in, in the work. So I wanted to create work related to time. So thinking about, okay, the further layer is 3,000 years old, the middle layer is 1,000 years old, and the front layer is now. So the, in, in this work, probably is the only one, in the only artwork that I kind of symbolically took existing, uh, uh, existing imagery, like Palmyra in the back or Citadella Palepo in the back. But in the center one, it's all completely imaginary. I wanted to capture uh, how different fates and different different uh, uh, structures lean on each other and exist, and almost like it's it's a one one building, even though they're they're different different fates and different cultures, and they're intact. They're beautifully standing straight, and for for thousands of years, the one in the front is now it's like the last let's say 10, 15 years, and twenty years. What's happening in that part of the world? Unfortunately many of the minorities forced to leave, including the Armenians. So there I was exploring that. And when you're witnessing the work, you see it as one. But when you're moving, it creates this movement. And you're kind of uh, curious to go through and to start it kind of like, like a book to kind of open and look into different pages and different chapters. So that was kind of a, a cornerstone of uh, the large scale installations. And this one is paper. I've done two more paperwork, and from um, just the last maybe a year and a half, I've been working on 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 fabric, on cotton fabric. So, when you approach the problem of a, of a large scale piece like that, um, how do you maintain that sense of spontaneity, knowing that you're going yeah. to have to have this installed piece in a in a space that people are going to encounter, and also with without you there, right? So, how are you going to yeah. plan that out? So the idea of uh, having one important message, it's kind of the core, core of the piece. So there, as I said, you know, memories uh, of stone, is, it's about what the, what the stones are kind of giving you as a message. You're there, you're hearing. And it is important for me to explore the idea of can you walk through them? It means you're going so close and you're witnessing an individual, individual stone to tell you something. So I had that, that concept. And then... The gesture 
to create things spontaneous. Uh, especially uh, my approach is I create to work on um, uh, acetate. It's a, it's a glossy surface. And then I just create the print of it, the monotype. So every time I'm creating that, the image is reverse. So if I'm thinking about writing Armenian, I should think about writing in Arabic because Armenian goes in from left to right. Arabic is from... So it's continuously your, your, your mind is shifting between languages when you're doing Because most of these works, I kind of put symbolically the idea of ancient forms of writings. So this, when I'm creating it, it has to be in, in spontaneous uh, approach. When I'm creating this, sometimes these images... It, it comes out that I did not plan, but overall, I know that I'm talking about one specific topic, but the detail is very different. And once you print that, once you press that on the surface, you cannot go back and erase it unless you do all over again, you do the whole layer all over again. So to look at the piece and to see this calligraphic approach and the spontaneous lines, it's very important. And at the same time, it helps me to move forward with, with surprising because it's important for me to also surprise myself and to make it exciting because every time I'm creating a work, it shouldn't copy itself. It should be something different. So that's why I create that moment of improvisation in the installation important. I mean, I think one, one thing that I really love about your pieces um, is that when you encounter them as a viewer, and I, and I think, you know, I'm coming at this from an art historical, an art historian's point of view. Um, but when you when you're looking at this piece, you start to see things that are recognizable. So you see, you know, something that looks like a, a, an inscription in Arabic, or you see um, a piece that feels like an impression made by a Babylonian seal, um, or you see, you know, arcades and colonnades that um, that look like, you know, or, or evoke the feeling of a of the winding streets of, of a medieval city. Um, so one thing that I always wonder about that work is, you know, what what are these places? You know, what are we seeing, and how? What are they to you? What is for me very important to think about that I'm creating those works on the kind of uh, shoulders of the giants. So it's like this: these works are inspired from the Mesopotamia. So I was born in Mesopotamia. So I feel like uh, symbolically I'm, I'm becoming their voices, the ancient culture's voices. So when I started creating works spontaneously, I think about it, those works are there already. I am just removing the dust. I think people know about Michelangelo's talk about when he takes a piece of marble, he says the artwork is in, I'm just peeling it off. I feel that way. I feel that way 100%. And I think that gives you a tremendous amount of joy when you know that there's nothing wrong. What even even something uh, even any accident happens there that could be a beautiful a new way of going further instead of just copying yourself. So for me, when I create things inspired by the Babylonian culture or or ancient Armenian Urardu and all this, I feel like it's it's very beautiful to build on top of all this. And even when I'm creating works like uh, recent works, mm -hmm. they look like abstract works, but if you start peeling it off the layers, you might see the reminiscent of this old culture in it. And it, it makes it exciting where you combine this ancient world with the contemporary world and becomes, it's, it's kind of a language where people are uh, curious to, to, to know how it's uh, uh, done or perceived. Um, so it you know, plays into this idea that you talk about with you know, personal memory, collective memory, um, and again, as an, as an architectural historian, uh, it's hard for me not to see that work outside of the context of, of Syria and Armenia, where I see so many reflections of, of, of you know, the, the art and artifacts of that, of that place. Um, you know, these sort of beautiful and extremely complex histories that you were talking about um, that are, and, and you mentioned this before, the victims of, of violence. Um, you know, some of them is the violence of time passing, you know, sort of natural violence and destruction, but then also the actual violence that's wrought by, by human hands. Um, so one thing I've wondered about you, and I've never had the chance to ask, so here I am. Um, do you see yourself a, as an activist? And, and by that, I mean, um, do you see that there's a part of your work here that in drawing attention to some of that violence you're advocating um, for a change? 
I definitely think about myself as an activist because artists need to uh, create awareness, need to change time. But sometimes those words are very big and I don't like to title myself as an activist. Maybe if you, if you look uh, what I say or what I do, I never mentioned that. But to create through the art awareness, to change something to better, it's amazing. I think it gives you hope to wake up and to, to work again. And especially if you can influence politicians, you can influence other people that we need to understand that let's give room to coexist. It's, it's possible, it was done in the past. When I create those works, even though sometimes you see that I'm creating destructions or I'm creating uh, figures on the ground, that doesn't mean that I am uh, uh, kind of uh, addressing that as like, oh, this, this is what I do. No, I'm just putting, again, creating this idea of mirror. When someone looks at that, it's enough. Enough is enough. History is repeating itself, and we need to figure out a way to create a different approach for, for future. And yes, art, artists should document their time and should, should create works that uh, makes better hopeful tomorrow. And this is that, the way I think. I'm not saying artists need to do that way, but it's... No, yeah. I mean, it's, it's something I've been thinking about, you know, as... You're talking a lot about collaboration, and soon you and I will enter into a collaboration. And, and I'm thinking about you know that word and and what it means to me, um, and and you know, what these places mean to me, and and how it how that interacts with with your work. So I have I have time for one more question, and and I think to bring it back to um, to our collaboration in the spring, um, something you and I have talked about a lot is is um, is that is the encounter with the work um, and this, you know, the sense of looking at art together is something that we're um, profoundly missing at this moment in time. So what are, are you hoping that visitors will, will gain from their experience um, with your piece at the Cantor? I'm glad you, you mentioned you, the word visitors because nowadays we're, we're kind of, we feel stuck, we're using Zoom, like everyone else is in their, in their home and watching this. I wanted to create work where it's in uh, using all the senses. It's I want to create work as an immersive experience without using the technology. So I want to create this installation where people are in it. They're allowed to walk in it and to have this journey. At least for a short period, they'll forget about this uh, uh, unpre unprecedented time and this this heavy time that we we we've been in. So. To, through that, I also want to have this approach where many people, they, don't, they didn't have this luxury to go to historic places. I'm creating this historic work and bring them to them. So almost like they are feeling it, they, they could touch it, they could hear it, all that. And this time, it's not about physical location. It's not going to be inspired by Syria or the Middle East or um, any other place. It's, it's a space where... I want people to feel like they've been there before, even though the whole thing is imaginary. And I want this sense of collective memory to be the most important thing because we share that all of it. Doesn't matter where you come from, when you're witnessing that, you're gonna feel this discomfort. You're kind of surrounded and, and kind of like hugged by this work. And that's, that's my main uh, philosophy in this work. I'm hoping, and I, I'm, I want it to be you know, transformational, which I, I think it's going to be. Um, and really meditative, which is something we all we all need right now. Um, I would love to. So I'm going to pass this back to Mark. But as we're moving out, I'd love to show your Tower of Babel piece, um, just as an example of something that you've done recently um, that adheres to some of these themes, but also physical, um, the way that you are immersed in the space. Yeah, so this, this work is, is, is a good example to, to mention that this doesn't belong to a specific uh, a place, even though Tower of Babel is kind of a Babel, which is Mesopotamia. But here, I, my approach or my, my uh, philosophy about this work is about diversity and about humanity in general, because here now I'm exploring the idea of ancient writing and the beginning of the writings. So you are standing in front of this tower. The tower has layers. But through the windows, you might hear your ancestors are talking to you. It doesn't matter where you come from, because Babel is kind of birth of languages, the idea of birth of languages. So you're there, you're feeling that, 
this artwork, it unites people, brings people together. doesn't matter where you come from. Great. That's great. Thanks so much to Brooke, Osvaldo, Meredith. By the way, just a quick word. Um, Osvaldo and Kavorg both mentioned this collaboration. Um, and I wanted to make sure people knew what that was. So um, Osvaldo composed a, a wonderful piece, an amazing piece called Falling Out of Time, um, which was based on the book Falling Out of Time da, by David Grossman, the Israeli novelist. And that work, as many of you know, um, premiered last year at Holy Cross. Um, and that was an extraordinary event. So thank you for that, uh, Osvaldo, and thank you, Silk Road. What has happened subsequently is that Osvaldo and Kavork have been in touch about whether it might be possible or how it might be possible to, uh, to bring visuals into the picture. And so that little clip that you saw is uh, an, a, a, uh, an installment, I guess one could say. And I don't know what the current plans are, but I guess it's still possible that that animation may one day be as long as the piece itself, which means it's going to be a whole lot of work. So I just wanted to make sure people had a sense for what that collaboration is. Um, I have uh, another question, but I'm going to defer first. Osvaldo, you... you uh, you kind of stopped short when your clip came on, and I didn't know whether you wanted any finishing touches or anything else that you wanted to say. Um, I just want, especially for our students, to to again to underline for maybe one too many times the, the idea of trust. And it's true what what Keborg said that I just had the sense that um, that Keborg was going to just get it and 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 it was true because when we sent the first trailer like like the musicians and i we all all realized that the music sounds much better with the animation <laughs> and and uh, it's just like the magic between the, the the possibility of collaborating with artists that trust each other that's what, that's what it is that's great, thank you. No, it's it's. I'm excited about the collaboration. Um, when I saw the first images, I thought, "Wow, this is going to be unbelievable," and uh, I guess we'll just have to wait for a little while, you know. Meredith, well, is there anything? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just a little while. M Meredith, anything that you wanted to uh, to add um, in terms of finishing touches? I, I mean, I think you know. I, I'm I'm interested in um, you know what it means for a uh, for cave work to be creating in in our space um, when we come to the time in the spring when he's he's with us uh, and uh, sort of if that's if 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 that's an extension of the collaborative process for you cave work to be in residence as you're creating um, or um, how how that extends your ideas about artistic process why do first of what all, are we going to see <laughs> first of all it's an incredible luxury to to work with you know thinkers and creative people like osvaldo and like you Meredith, where trust is kind of the big part of it i remember when i when i told you Meredith, that is it okay to approach this installation as an improvised concept because I still don't know how, who, how, what direction we're, we're, we're heading. I know that it's going to be immersive experience. I know it's going to be very dense works. I know it's going to be different than anything else I've done because I'm allowing people to walk into the works. But at the same time, when you know, I think about the trust and I think about the collaboration, it's true, it's true collaboration between me and Oswaldo. It's like it's the perfect thing where you don't need to explain so much and then the work comes out in a way that hey, I feel huge responsibility to put all of my efforts, all of my skills to create something very powerful and very moving because the music is like that and merit the same thing because you are trusting me to to come and take the space over and share this with 
the students there, it's like it's huge responsibility because students just coming out of this pandemic and they want something that moves them and, and gives them hope to move forward. And that's an important thing to put into works. Yeah, I just like one 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 note because we keep talking about spontaneity and improvisation, but this happens when people are practicing. 22 hours a day, like a is painting all the time. I'm I mean, John Coltrane, all these people that improvise. Yes, he improvised, but they have been practicing for decades and 20 hours a day. And, and then you have to forget everything and just be, right? But if you don't practice, <laughs> then it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's the, yeah, it's the idea. I, I, yeah learning how to walk but then you forget about walking it's just a simple example but it's there mm -hmm. but yeah Osvaldo I mean it's so much structure needs to be laid down first before that kind of improvisational freedom is even possible um, mm -hmm. sure let me let me ask a question that that has to do with not this specific piece or that specific piece, but your own your own concern for the world, <laughs> because I know it's a significant part of your profile. Um, you know, on one level, your work is rooted in specificity, the specificity of place and history and culture, right? Syria, Armenia, and so on, the plight of refugees. And I know how important that specificity is to you. Um, at the same time, you're also somebody whose work seeks to transcend that specificity and speak to humanity, to what we share or what we might share. You've said a little bit of that today. Um, so I know how important that kind of larger canvas is to you as well. Can you just share with us as we come to a close how you as an artist try to kind of navigate between the specificity of cultures and peoples and languages and realities and your hope that somehow we can find one another as humans in your work? A big question, I know. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is very dense and multi-layered uh, question. But I think my mission in life is to understand that there is nothing wrong uh, to get inspired by other cultures. It's, it's important to figure out a way uh, that to take or to borrow from your past, from your ancestors, and to share that with people that they don't know anything about you, it's, it's, it's blessing. So yeah. I'm worried about future for sure, but at the same time, uh, I'm trying to hold on about memories and, and those forms and shapes as long as I can to, to build everything on top of it. Because if we forget our past, we forget everything. So it's, it's important to, to share, like this, this uh, the last thing about the Tower of Babel. I wanted to bring people together through art, even though this is, this is huge work to say, it's a huge responsibility. But I think when you hear Oswaldo's work falling out of time, you don't think about that it's, it's only directed to specific people. It's it directed about humanity. It's about father's feeling, about his son's loss. And my approach, even though I'm, I'm putting, I'm adding my own elements of uh, history and imagining in it. And when that work, let's say, it becomes a workshop in the Holy Cross, the students can take that and build on top of, that this is what we want. We want to create things where it inspires other people. And together we make this, this circle where collectively it creates this, inspiring thing where people are moved to continuously create, to come out of hard times like this. And I think we, we're gonna see more and more uh, harder times to come. So we have to figure out this, this thing that we have in our hands to create and to share and to let other younger, younger people to get inspired and create more. Well, you're certainly doing that. And uh, you're a model of creativity and a model of generosity. And um, we're all Thank immensely you. grateful that, that you're here with us, sharing your oh, work, you. sharing your ideas, sharing your tea. I wish we could share it. Yes. So, <laughs> I think that, um, 
we can come to a close. Let's uh, also thank Oswaldo Golihoff and Meredith Fluk. Um, it's been a wonderful hour. And uh, I hope the audience out there has found it to be uh, of as much value as we have. Uh, so thank Meredith, you. Shall we, shall we mention about uh, opening? When is uh, where we're oh, yeah, imagining please. to open? March 4th, I believe is the date we're giving. 2021. Um, it's, it feels like um, a, a lifetime in front of us before we get there, um, but it will come quickly and we will invite you to come see it when we have it up. See you in person, the other side, in person. Let us hope. <laughs> Let us hope. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Meredith.